Welcome back to Twist of Fate, a small business podcast where you can find your inspiration to make your entrepreneurial dreams come true. Today's topic is very special to me, electrification. Now I get it, I get it, don't get all political. I'm not gonna be on here preaching about climate change. Actually, there are financial incentives and reasons that you might wanna think about using a little bit less natural gas and moving into sustainable technologies that will optimize your budgets, save you money. That's, that's what we're all about here in business. And we have been blessed to have a guest today that is an educator, an entrepreneur, a business owner, and an amazing electrical engineering mind. Larry Waters from Electrify My Home. Welcome to Twist of Fate. Hey, thanks, Doug. I, that's the best introduction I've ever had, just by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope to live up to hype, but listen, you deserve it, my friend. So one thing that's fascinating of working with you is that this electrification boom that's kind of happened recently, you've been working in this space long before this was a trendy or interesting concept. So can we go back in time and talk a little bit about that? What is it about electrification and all these heat pumps and things like that? How did you get, even get into that? Well, the whole thing is just electrifying to begin with. But so, I mean, uh, 42 years as a, as a regular HVAC contractor in all aspects of the business, I did a lot of sales and, and engineering and design. Throughout my career, I've, I've gotten different uh, certifications and education. And about 10, 12 years ago, I learned how to make houses really efficient. And so the problem that presented itself then is typical heating and cooling equipment was all too big for the houses after I got done making them theoretically smaller. So we were looking for a new solution and we started installing heat pumps. This is back around 2014, 2015. And we realized that the technology for electric was far better than gas at that time. So we just kind of ran with it. We were making really comfortable homes that were really energy efficient even back then. And because I developed a little bit of expertise through that time and, and had a story to tell, I was invited to join the uh, and become a board member for the Decarbonization Coalition. And I helped consult with some state programs. And I just introduced myself to some of the right people. And it kind of came from there. So I had a voice, I had the experience and knowledge, and then the opportunity presents itself. Like every, everything is changing. So I knew I was working for a company at the time. Um, I was either going to grease that guy's gears or, um, decide whether or not my squeaky gears need to be greased themselves. <laughs> and I knew that as long as I was working for somebody that didn't have the passion that I did for it, that I needed to start my own thing. So Electrify My Home was kind of born at that time. It was really an idea through 2019. Mm -hmm. And then I retired from there and started the whole thing right in 2020. Um, I started the business four weeks before the two weeks to stop the spread. So you know what that was about, right? So it was a little bit of a challenge on startups. Stressful, but, stressful, yeah. right? Yeah. So let's, let me ask you this question because a lot of my listeners could be homeowners or they could benefit from these technologies, but they may not know about them. So like, for example, when you talk about a heat pump, could you explain to my audience like what they're currently probably using versus the advantages? Could, could you, could you clarify for them? Yeah. Yeah. So, so electrification is, is a, process of changing your house from gas reliant to all electric clean energy and the the kind of the forces that be are moving us towards that whether it be with all out gas bans in cities or or the elimination in california you won't be able to buy a gas furnace anymore after 2030 or a gas water heater um so we're moving towards that way so we can't heat houses for, for better or for worse guys right, again right. larry or not i are not saying that we, we Right. That this is the right thing. It's just a statement of fact. Exactly. And this is this is what when we train the contractors throughout the state and, and my position is on it. If you're going to live and work here, you're going to have to deal with it. 
And so let's deal with it in the most efficient way possible. And that's through installation of properly sized heat pumps. Now, what is a heat pump was your question. So everybody has a heat pump in their house. It's your refrigerator. You, you slide the, the warm leftovers in there. The refrigerator pulls the heat out of them and puts it on the kitchen floor. That's a heat pump. If you've got a central air conditioner in your house, that's a heat pump that only works one way. So basically it's that central air conditioning or refrigeration that can work in two different directions to either heat or cool your house. But when we do our houses electrically, it's very much like riding in a, an electric car. You have to operate them a little bit differently, but the performance is amazing and the energy efficiency is out of sight. Mm. So we often do whole house conversions where we're reducing our customers um, overall costs monthly dramatically by putting these new high tech super comfort systems in their homes. So there's no reason to not want to go electric other than just going, they're telling me to, right? Yeah. So and, and we see that a lot. And in California, it's going that way. As more and more people get away from gas in California, it's going to cause the gas cost to, to rise quickly. Experts are saying natural gas costs could go up four times based on what it was in 2021. And that's like $9 a therm. If nobody knows what a therm is, it's that little bit that they bill you for on your utility bill every month. And if we think about $9, you take your existing gas bill, times it by four, and that's the potential of what it can be just at 2035. We're not that far from 2035. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good time to get this done because there's incentives and there's a lot of reasons to do it, but you really need to choose a professional to do it. Agreed. And this is where you decided to create a company that you're kind of doing a couple things here. It's visit, assess, or virtually assess a home where you can then advise them as to which of these technologies they could benefit from, correct? Correct, correct. And and one of the things like entrepreneurs, what we all want to do is we want to change the world. We want to disrupt. We want to do all our things. But we also want to build a positive experience about all those negative ones we had in our career. And one of the things I hated exactly as an HVAC salesperson was um, what we call windshield time. Like I'm driving out to somebody's house. I don't know them. We're going to knock on the door, find out what they need. And maybe they need, maybe they need what I have, or maybe they don't. So it's a big waste of time. So when I put my whole business together, I developed this virtual assessment process or this. So I meet everybody virtually first. They fill out a really easy to fill out form on our website. It gives us a lot of information about their home. We do a little bit of backend internet research. And then we, uh, we meet with them for about an hour, hour and a half virtually. And we can give them budget numbers on their, on their whole project just after that hour and a half call. So we don't have to waste a bunch of time. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are like, oh, I can't afford that. Other people are like, well, I want it a little different, whatever. But we're able to do that without wasting their time, knocking on their door. And we, we do a, it's, it's like a webinar based process or more of a, um, yeah, like a webinar based process. And, um, so we're presenting an actual slideshow to them. And that would be awkward to do if I was sitting at your kitchen table between you and your wife flipping through an iPad or something. So it's really mm -hmm. easy to do now. And I knew my clientele when I started the business, my clientele, a lot of technological people, a lot of younger people that are really environmentally conscious. And then also just a lot of people that want to save money on their energy. But everybody, Zoom was a great thing through, you know, not a lot of good things came from the pandemic, but Zoom was a breakthrough. Everybody got used to it. Now they're used to meeting that way. So it's so much better of a way to meet a customer and get that going than to waste a bunch of energy and, and, and you know, produce a bunch of carbon driving out to their house. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to doing it that way. And one of them is, you know, you don't got another stranger traipsing around your house. We can, you know, I'm a homeowner and my Bosch dishwasher breaks down all the time. Well, normally people would charge you $75 to $150 just to come and assess what you're doing. But I, I really think it's great that you're using a transformative technology like Zoom because now it's a free virtual assessment. Exactly. That's what I like about it. Now, Next up, though, if you go through the virtual assessment, you could, if they're interested in moving forward, they could move forward with like a live visit. One of the reasons we do a virtual visit with budget numbers up front is because if we were going to come out and do a, a site visit and look at everything in, in, in the beginning, it would be, we would really have to charge a lot for that. 
So the virtual visit kind of gets you the budget numbers you need, gets you an idea of where you're going before you say, yes, I want to invest in somebody actually coming out. Because, you know, the industry that we're in, um, they will send people out to your house all day long for free because they're going to put the same box in. They're going to kind of just do what we call a box swap or whatever. And um, they're not going to do all the things that we do. So, you know, we were crawling around in your attic for quite a while. We measured every room and every window in your house. And we have, we have, uh, we have a really good idea of everything that's going on here. And we were here for a couple of hours, right? So we don't charge our customers for that up front. We want to make sure they know the budget and kind of where things are going to be. And then we, we include that in the cost of the job. We found that that's a better way to get the customers the information they need without, like, charging them for something they may never use guys you don't understand they've got some really high-tech tools you guys are measuring uh, my understanding is the negative pressure that's created for my hvac when my doors are closed which can affect you know the actual cooling pace of certain rooms right and uh i was really impressed with that and then after that let's say um you provide an estimate to somebody you've done the live visit you actually can either recommend other contractors or organizations to to install things or you can your teams can do it yourselves correct right 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 we do we do the majority of the installations in our service area ourselves but because our company is not we're not showing up as your local home provider. We're not like a traditional HVAC company or electrical company or whatever. We have a larger span. And because we teach contractors all over the state, this the, our principles and kind of the way we do things, we have a nice Rolodex of partners all throughout the state. So when we get customers from outside our service area, we do the, we do the initial um, uh, virtual assessment with them. We'll do the load calculations and we'll do all that. And then we can hook them up with a contractor in their area to get the job done. That's already a trusted provider of electrifying. Got it. Twisted Fate will be right back. Enjoying this episode and want more Twist of Fate? Let's do this thing. I am fierce, I am powerful. No, we're gonna do it and then we're gonna do it and we're gonna make our own brokerage with it. I think your strategy was different. It's not just me, it's a team. No, we're gonna work with you and we're gonna walk with you. Check out over 40 episodes with new ones on the way. Find your inspiration with Twist of Fate, available to stream on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. A lot of us don't even know all the things that can be electrified. Absolutely. So I'd like to play a little game with you. All right, let's do it. So so maybe if we start to go through certain opportunities to be electrified. Okay. So I have an inline water heater, which you had said that's very wasteful. Yes. The inline water heater, why is that an opportunity for electrification? Well, an online water heater, otherwise known as a tankless or an on-demand water heater, um, those are a bit wasteful. And there's a couple of there's a couple of advantages and disadvantages to those. The disadvantage is it's still gas in the house, so we're still going to keep a, a line connected. The other disadvantage is um, there's no water sitting out there if you ever needed it. Like if the if some tragedy happened and the water was off for a couple of days, you don't have like a storage facility for no. water in your house. So tank water heaters are really better for safety in that case. And then now we have heat pump, electric heat pump water heater technology that can heat your water for a fraction of the cost. You do need to store some hot water, mm. but we can also offset the cost on that unit. Mm. And so that's what we do with a lot of our offerings is we can actually transfer energy from where it's cheap and there's a lot of it and then use that energy later when in, when it costs a lot to re recover it. Mm -hmm. So we can do all these strategies to help reduce costs. So with a with a tankless water heater, you don't have that ability. The other thing is with a tankless water heater, that water's not hot yet. No. So when you turn on your faucet upstairs in the furthest bathroom, you have to wait for all the water to go through all the pipes, plus all the water that goes through the water heater before it gets warm. It's every day. Every day, right? And then that's thousands and thousands of gallons of water wasted every single year. So just by taking one of those out and putting in a heat pump water with, without even putting in a, a, a pump or anything, we can save you thousands of gallons a year just in wait time. Okay, next up, the a lot of people don't know that the natural gas stovetops 
or is it another opportunity for electrification? And even for better health, maybe you want to talk about that? So we had gas range forever. Interesting story. I moved into my house 25 years ago. I took out a bunch of the electric stuff and put in gas because it was cheaper. It's no longer cheaper. So when I switched over to my electric range, my wife's resistance was I can no longer like warm a tortilla on the, on the, on the <laughs> stovetop, right? And I said, well, that's the only problem. But now we have great electric induction range that boils water in half the time, has precise temperature control. It still looks as beautiful as the day it was installed because it doesn't get hot. It uses magnetics to actually heat the pans to cook the food. So they don't burn. You don't get the burn. Right. You don't get the, the burn. Bottom of the now, if you turn it up all the way, you don't want to make like a, like a delicate sauce in there and turn your back on it while you're learning to use the machine. Right, right, right. But, but once you get it all dialed in and, and learn how to use the machine, it, it's just an amazing cooking appliance. So much better response time, so much better temperature control than you can even get with gas. But the big thing about gas um, units is they're not really good. So what a lot of people don't know is with their furnace and with their water heaters, they got these pipes coming off of them. And when those flames come out, that exhaust, like what comes out of your car, comes out of these appliances. And that's really why we're trying to electrify, right? There's a lot of exhaust causing a lot of dirty But that air. exhaust is bad. You're breathing that in your You're house. You're breathing that. So your stove is the only gas appliance you have in your house that doesn't have a flue pipe. And it's open to the inside of the house. So there's, there's a, a level of this, of this chemical called nitrogen oxide. And nitrogen oxide is a very toxic chemical. And the, the um, EPA says you can only have 100 parts per billion outside of nitrogen oxide at any time. If you cook one dish on a gas range, your house gets like 160 parts per billion inside the house. Mm. You cook a whole meal on your gas range, it can get up to 450, 500 parts per billion, which is way over. And so most, most people have some sort of a hood fan or something above their, above their stove, but most people don't turn it on. Like yeah. it makes too much noise, whatever. And so they don't ever turn it on and all of that stuff goes into the house. So they've actually done studies, a lot of studies, and these studies have been around for a while, but you have children in your house with a gas range, they're 40% more likely to develop onset asthma as a child. Interesting. So just that gas in your house can be detrimental to your family's health. So it's another reason why electrification is not a bad thing to do. So now we're saving money, we're more comfortable, and our, and our families are safer. I think uh, it's fantastic work you're doing in terms of the total amount of natural gas exposure, greenhouse gas reduction, and even you know moving into the amount of money that you're saving people. That's huge. I mean, that's a huge positive societal impact of what you're doing. I don't know that you ever take time to pat yourself on the back for that, but I'm here's a fist bump to you. Right on. I appreciate you're, that. You're doing a great service to the people of California, and um, I think you're setting an example to the rest of the, 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 the states that all political issues aside, electrification makes sense. Why would we not move forward with that? So California, five of our cities are the, all, not completely the top five, but in the top eight of the most polluted cities in the country. And that's really why we're electrifying. It's not climate change per se. It's because the air is still dirty after all the work we've done. Um, electrification is going to be instrumental in us reducing that. But also, if it's done properly in people's houses, you can adopt this and it just gives you a better life. I mean, mm -hmm. it's more comfortable home, less expensive to operate if it's done properly. And, um, and just quiet. Like my system at my house, it turns on, I can't hear it run. Mm -hmm. My house is always the same temperature. My bills are tiny. If you have renewable energy on your roof or a battery on the side of your house and you buy a new gas appliance, it's crazy nowadays because we can put systems on that your solar is going to offset. So you won't pay anything to operate those things anymore. So we've just come into a time where the perfect storm is happening. We got all these reasons why we're doing it and all this great technology to do it with. But you have to find the right person that's going to use that technology to, to do it properly. See, I think the beauty of your business model that I've learned is that it was one thing to move towards a electric car or solar, these technologies, but there's so much more to your house than that. The air you breathe, the temperatures you have, like, yeah, it's, uh, it's honestly to those listening. If you think electrification is just about the EV car, you, you, you've totally missed the boat on that. Like, Absolutely. and, and you have to make adjustments to the home 
so that you can get the most out of these technology investments that you make. That's just what I've Right, done. right. And you want to live in a modern home. I mean, this is just the way everything has gone. Like the electric car, you can't go to a stoplight without seeing six of them now. Well, so this where is, we live here Right, now. especially right here, right? Yeah. And so this is just the natural transition of things. We're modernizing things. And gas heating and gas water heating technology is 150 years old. It hasn't changed that much. No. But uh, electronic technology and comfort technologies have changed radically just in the last couple of decades. So we can put a system in that's electric, that's going to use far less energy. It's going to be super quiet, super comfortable. You're going to love it. People, my customers love these things. Mm -hmm. And then if we can do, then we get the societal benefit. The societal benefit is if we electrified all the homes in the greater Bay Area, just kind of the Bay Area basin, even west of here. It would, it would cancel out enough carbon emissions that we don't have to worry about all the exhaust pipes anymore. Mm -hmm. There are definitely some opinions out there that could say, well, you can electrify everything, but then where does all the electricity come from? Now, you know, it's a perspective that people have. Right. I know for me personally, we're right on here talking about solar, collecting during the day, storing at night. That's one solution, but I think that is probably one of the biggest arguments against our state about this, you know, how can you move all the cars to electric if you don't have the, the grid infrastructure to do it? But this is where you come in. To me, this is where electrification comes in. If all of our houses are efficient, the houses become the grid, right? Exactly. The and houses so, become right. the virtual power plant needed right. to fund all this. Right, right. And electrifying your house is cheaper than buying an electric car. And it's going to give you impact in your own home that you're going to see every month on your bill, right? It, it, it's going to give you that instant impact. And if we do this and we do it right and we change out 3 million old air conditioners with good, efficient new heat pumps, it'll actually create a net decrease on the grid for that. And so it may mean that we need to rely less on electric cars in the short term. I... I feel that there is some misunderstanding what electrification is, or it's been politicized in some way. But everything you say on this podcast episode, it's just, it's fact. It's just, this is not theory. This is yeah, this is just what's happening out there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Twist of Fate will be right back. Want to be part of our growing community of entrepreneurs and business owners? Join our Patreon and gain access to all of our content, including exclusive videos, Twist of Fate merchandise, and bonus educational content. You can also advertise right on Twist of Fate by joining our ad partner program. Don't have an ad to run yet? That's okay. We can help you by producing a Twist of Fate perfect ad like this one. Check out the show notes and learn how to apply to become an ad partner. And of course, we always appreciate when you like, subscribe, and share. Now let's get back to Twist of Fate. Larry, one thing about being a business owner is you get gut punched more readily than not. The title of the show we selected, Twist of Fate, is it's a state of mind of where you're taking a negative event like a gut punch and you transfer it to more like positive energy or like in a, in a more productive way. So I, I don't know, is there any setbacks or adversity or things that you faced starting this business that you've been able to turn on its head and kind of make it a win? So when I started this business and started my first payroll, which is about 30 months ago, I actually started the business four years ago, incubated it in another company. Um, my relationship with the other company that I was incubating my business with, their, their, their plan wasn't exactly as my plan. Mm -hmm. So I exited my operation with them. Um, one of my very good coworkers at that point traveled with me and his wife came aboard as our office manager. So I literally started this business with my, my friend that I had hired at this other company and as, as my lead installer, and he and I went out and installed all the work for the first three months, and his wife was managing the office. He helped train some of my key individuals that are here now, but he took another job 
And, and that was a gut punch for me because I really thought we were deeper than that. Mm -hmm. And I found out subsequently after having conflict, because we're still very good friends and we run into each other all the time. And um, I, made a dis I, I, I made the mistake of not giving him what he needed, even if it sacrificed what we needed. Mm. I should have paid him a little better. He was making good money. He was up to make, he was going to make six figures, never made that before in his life, but he got a better job offer from a big company. And, but now he commutes like now he's on the highway for five hours a day. So last time I saw him, he said, half of me wishes I was still with you. Half of me is glad I moved. And so that was a bit of a gut punch, hurt, right? That it, hurt. It, it really hurt, but it also spurred me into understanding that I needed to have relationships with my employees, but I also needed to have employees with my employees because it really hurt me on a friendship level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as I've moved through and we've hired people strategically for our company, it's very much, I love my employees. I treat them well. We have good times, but they're, they're, they're still there to do a job. Mm -hmm. And so I can't let the cult of personality get involved in it too much. And I need to, even though I may like somebody very much, if something goes wrong, we have to deal with it and it can't always be rosy. And so business is business, business, business is business. Took me a minute to figure that out. I've struggled with these myself. I want you to know that. I think, uh, this is my fifth year in my business and I call them alumni. They're, they're probably watching. These are employees that came contributed. They helped build this place. But for forces that I felt were out of my control, the same things happen. You can't, you can't pay more than what the business can deliver, but then people have their own needs. Exactly. And when they leave, I think this is a side of being a founder people don't understand. We're still human. It hurts. It hurts. You feel betrayed at times. But, you know, like you said, you almost... You have to develop like that armor plating that, you know, you have to lock some of these feelings inside because it's not good for business. It's not good for mental health either. It's not good for your mental health to, to lose a friend. Right, but right. Sometimes in business, that's going to happen. Larry, you're a man of many talents. You can electrify, you can assess. You've worked in the HVAC industry for 40 plus years. But then you're also a founder and a business leader. How do you manage this balance of doing the hands-on work, yet at the same time being the leader your business needs you to be? It, it's got to be an imbalance, right? Like it's not a perfect science. It can't be. It's not. It's not. And I think we went through the same thing that a lot of founders and startups do. I was fortunate to come into this this business with 40 years experience in my trade per se, but I didn't have any experience running a business. I was a, I was a sales and designer and a manager and a service technician and installer. So I'd had all the roles during my career. So that was really handy because the first three months of operating the business, I was actually out there in the attics, putting these systems in with my, with my guy. Right. And, um, but it was all about the dream. And, and so what happened with me is I had enough pain with the company I was at before, which by the way, I was making an extremely good living, but I felt like it wasn't what I needed to do because of what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I got really detailed in my business plan. And I said, this is what I want to build. And I look at my business plan every year and I make sure that I'm still on course. And I can tell you, other than be, me doing this podcast with you, I am exactly where I thought I would be four years into owning my business right now. So some things are a little better. Some things are not as good. Mm -hmm. But when I got into this and realized there is a lot to owning a business, there's, <laughs> I mean, you got taxes. What? Mm. Who knew, right? Like business taxes, payroll taxes. So I tried to do the right thing up front. I got payroll company. I got everything to make it as easy as possible. But then there's issues with that. And then trying to hire people and not providing benefits because I didn't have the money to do it yet. So bringing benefit plans on, that was a leap of faith. Um, I didn't realize how much things were going to cost. Because we have, we have a company. We drive trucks out to people's houses. There's tools and materials and all this. When I'm just starting out of business, I was fortunate that I knew a lot of the suppliers just from working in the industry. So I had relationships. But none of these guys are going to come out and say, hey, we're going to give you credit on day one.
Right. So it was right. having enough cash flow that I could that I could fund all the projects as they went through and just cross my fingers that everything was going to go well and I was going to get paid for each job so I could make payroll. So it was very lean, although we were blessed with a, a nice backlog of work when we first started. It was very lean for a while, and we had to build on step by step. Now I can afford to do this. I put a little money aside to be able to afford to do this. And now we've grown. We have eight vehicles. We have 14 employees. Um, and we've done that in a relatively short period of time, but we've done that by keeping our eye on the ball and keeping our eyes on the P's, P's and Q's. So I would say for anybody that's inspiring to do this, you need to realize what business is about. You have a talent that, that you can maybe grow off of. If you want to be, if you're an installer of something, you also have to know how to sell that. Because a lot of people that go out there and they say, you know what, my I'm going and installing all these things and we're collecting all this money for this. I get this money could be mine. And they don't realize that a sale has to be made before that happens. Right. And then the business has to be ran before that happens. And these guys see these, these tags coming in that if they only knew how little profit we made on an actual job, they, they would, they would not worry about it, but all they see is that check. Yeah. And then they're going, I, I could do this. And then they realize that they can't. And, and because they don't have all those pieces and you have to be willing to dig in and dig deep and do it. And so it's been a challenge, but fortunately I put a good team together. Twist of Fate will be right back. Hey, Twist of Fate listeners. Did you know you can book me, Doug Younger, DY3, to speak at your next event, deliver a keynote, or commencement speech. You know I'll bring all that twist of fate energy, as well as my experiences as the founder and CEO of Three Steps Forward, a marketing company. The accolades that come with being a university adjunct professor and lessons from my corporate career in Fortune 500 businesses traveling to over 40 countries worldwide. You can also book coaching and workshop sessions for you and your team. Book me using the link below in the description for this episode. Hey, you never know. You may find your own inspiration leading to a twist of fate. When you were thinking about starting a business, I mean, different skill set than electrification. Was there resources or any education or books that you chose to read to prepare you for that? Like, you know, the SBA has free resources. I know that you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. in Vacaville. Were you, was there any individuals or people that do you went to to kind of prepare for starting your own business? Yeah, you know, I, I, when I first started, I hit up SCORE and I, and I found a mentor and he helped me work through a lot of things, including um, hiring and separating some employees and kind of how to put, you know, some books together. And I and I had a um, I had a partner early on that helped with a lot of things, and and he he gave me some help with like figuring out how the numbers were going to work, and giving me an, an idea of how I needed to figure that out and what we need to look at. Mm -hmm. So uh, some financial forecasting stuff, mm -hmm. um, and then I, I got some trade associations, and I and I had had experience actually managing a big portion of an HVAC company before, so I knew kind of the inner workings of things, but I had no idea the complexity of what all this was going to be. So I drew upon all these things that I could find to answer those questions that came up as they came up. Mm -hmm. And so I'd go along for a while, I'd figure, wow, I don't know what this means, I need to find out. But my, my mentor from SCORE was helpful. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have, a, I've been in the trade for a long time, so I have a lot of peers that own HVAC businesses. So I was able to call on them for a little advice. Mm -hmm. And the, the company I worked at before, I'm still great friends with the owner of that company and most of the employees there. We had a very amicable like retirement. And so I call on him once in a while to just, you know, um, and I accuse him every time. I says, you guys made this look too easy. Right. So it was too easy when I was working there. And so now I'm understanding those. But um, I you went have out a different and found level of appreciation for a business. Is one thing to be an employee. It's a whole different other thing to be running the business. Right. It's in, it's incredibly different. And um, there's just so much responsibility. And I knew, Doug, when 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 I was in my 40s, um, I got this close to starting my own business then. But I was doing very well at the company I was at. And I just said, you know what? I'm a talk to him guy. I'm not a boss guy. 
I'm just going to ride this out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do it then. It was only for the opportunity of my, my subject matter knowledge and the fact that electrification is moving like it is that inspired me to start this business because there needed to be a voice out there. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit of I knew I could do it and I was going to have to figure out how I did it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there was a little bit of that. So um, I, I reached out to, to find information from whoever I could when I could. I joined the Chamber of Commerce as soon as I became a business. It was one of the things I was super excited to do. I started mingling with the other people around town, got some advice about that. Um, did a leadership training with, through my Chamber of Commerce in town. Um, so just anything I could do to enhance that. And I'm not going to tell you, I'm not like an MBA level business guy. Like I got sidelined by my QuickBooks like every every month, right? Let me tell you this. I'm an MBA guy. You've learned more in the four years of managing a business in COVID than any MBA degree, any business degree. This stuff can't be taught. You learn it by doing. You do learn it by doing. So I think, you know, you already have your MBA degree from my perspective. Well, all right. I appreciate that, Doug. <laughs> uh, we were outside in the backyard when you were doing the assessment here. And I said, hey, Larry, like I got a, I got a natural gas grill and I had this fire pit. Look at that fire pit. I go, what the hell am I going to do about that? And you said, Doug, not everything needs to be electrified. My opinion, you probably want to enjoy that fire pit as long as you can. And that shows a lot of character for you that you know all the advantages of electrification, but you still can appreciate the human side of some of these older technologies, these legacies, these traditions. I don't know if you remember yeah, this, but yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, that's my feeling on things. Let's, let's, let's electrify the things in our lives that cost us a lot to operate that we can feel the difference in right away, but let's enjoy the other things in life. Mm -hmm. Like if, if, if gas prices go up so high that, that Doug Younger has to think twice before you turn on your, your fireplace in your backyard, then maybe consider something else. Mm -hmm. right? But we don't need to go crazy on this stuff. <laughs> but it is good to do whatever reduction you can and enjoy the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Because the benefits of changing over are really amazing. This is awesome stuff. Now, uh, Larry, if some of my listeners, we already talked about, they could do the free virtual assessment. Uh, or even get an estimate so that they can do that. They just go to electrifymyhome.com, correct? Absolutely. You can't get that one wrong. It's electrifymyhome.com. And uh, right on there is a um, what they call the visitless energy assessment. And they just fill out some information about their home. And then once they've filled that out, you can upload a couple pictures or not. And then it will take them to an automatic booking link, and that'll book an hour and a half consultation with us in the office. And we will uh, do a little research on your house, and we'll share your, your options with you, explain to you why it's important to get it done properly and exactly how it gets done properly, exactly how we will approach it in your home, help you make the decisions. And then up to that point, it's all no charge. Fantastic. With that, I'm going to move to my final thoughts. Um, if you've been watching this episode in I hope you've been taking a lot of notes because there's a lot of knowledge that has been communicated here. Look, electrification isn't political. It's not us being right wing or left wing or any of that. It is fact in science. And if anything, uh, in business, um, I hope you learn from Larry here that keeping your eyes open in making fact-based objective decisions about the home you live in, the life you want to live, the air you breathe. That's not crazy talk. That, frankly, is the American way. That is our way. So with that, Larry, I really appreciate you joining this episode. And I think something that I appreciate about you, um, you've not just created a special service for the state of California. You're a family business, too. And I've really enjoyed meeting you and working with you and your family. And I hope that all of my Trista Fate listeners join the, your electrification family. Absolutely. Thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity with you, Doug. Anytime chatting with you is always a pleasure, but this was great. Absolutely. So if you like this content, like, share, subscribe. 
click the button. We It will really help us get this content out. We're trying to make an entrepreneurial ecosystem of people that are aspiring entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, founders, people that have exited, that we all get together to make this world a better place. With that, I'll see you on the next Twist of Fate. Twist of Fate is hosted by Doug Younger. It's produced by John Lenbed and Matthew Brown at Ezo Creative. Special thanks to all of our Patreon members. And if you want to be a part of our growing community, join our Patreon and gain access to bonus content, Twist of Fate merch, and more. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for listening.